This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are taking a look ahead at the NFL Divisional Round of the Playoffs. We are talking with Chris Andrews. He is the director of South Point Sportsbook, breaking down his lines for this weekend, what he's thinking about uh, various numbers, where he's leaning, and also talking about his book, Then One Day, 40 Years of Bookmaking in Nevada. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com joined here as always by ed feng you can find his work over at thepowerrank.com and find him on twitter at the power rank ed we are in the second round of the nfl playoffs it's an exciting time how you doing today i'm yeah. doing great looking forward to another uh excellent weekend of nfl football and uh yeah national title game on monday it's gonna be great yes. it's, it's a good no it's not a good it's a fantastic three days Absolutely. We broke down the national championship with Teddy Savransky. Teddy covers on yesterday's podcast. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, you can subscribe, rate, interview the podcast. Thank you to those of you who have done so already. And speaking of college football, before we came on the air today, it broke like 15 seconds, I think, before we called you, Ed. Mike Leach is going to Mississippi State, which means the Egg Bowl is Lane Kiffin versus Mike Leach. I don't yeah, know if I could possibly kind of, be more excited for this. I know. We were trying to line up some stuff with Chris Andrews and the call, and it was like you dropped a couch on top of my head. <laughs> to <get> that <laughs> um, This doesn't feel right to me. Mike Leach is, uh, to put it mildly, a bit quirky. Yep. And I think it kind of works in Washington State. Yep. And I just don't know if it works in the SEC. Yep. Uh, he's going to score. It, it just doesn't feel like a culture fit to me. I mean, maybe some parts of it do. Um, I think, uh, and, and part of the, from what I read, part of the problems with Joe Moorhead and why I got, why they decided to let him go. And so late in the season was, it, it was like a weird cultural fit because he was yeah. a, a guy from the Northeast and it, it kind of didn't work in the deep South there. It just doesn't seem right. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know football wise. I do know that it means that Mike Leach's postgame press conferences will no longer be at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and as an East Coaster, <laughs> selfishly, that's all I need. Because, like, I disagree with Mike Leach on several things, but I'm sure. never bored when I'm listening to him talk. And I find value in that. And it right. means that when I'm listening to him talk, it is not going to be Sunday morning when I'm trying to do NFL stuff. It's going right. to be, I can actually see it Saturday night. And so, like, <laughs> football stuff aside, Lane Kiffin, new rivalry with Mike Leach aside, I am selfishly excited to have Mike Leach press conferences not be in the middle of the night for me personally. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And and we'll see. I mean, if he can pay like $2, $2 million for a defensive coordinator, maybe he'll, maybe, yeah, maybe he'll get it done down there. So You never know. Um, um, you never know. I, I'm, I'm actually, I, I don't think that necessarily going to be happening. But I, but I like the idea of him getting yeah. a defensive coordinator and then obviously yeah. he takes the reins on the, the offensive side of the ball. But... And you can yeah. bet your it's bottom like, we'll be talking plenty about my leech once the fall comes around, too. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> going to be a whole lot of fun. I am looking forward to that for sure. So uh, next year is going to be interesting. We have a lot to wrap up on Monday as well with the national championship. So it's going to be a fun little stretch here across college football. But before then, we got to talk some NFL playoffs again. We're talking with Chris Andrews. He is the director of South Point Sportsbook. You can find him on Twitter at Andrews Sports. And, we're going to talk to him about his book. Again, it's called Then One Day. You can find that over on Amazon, previewing the divisional round of the NFL playoffs and talking a little bit of uh, just sports book stuff in general. Because, Ed, we talked with John Sheeran last week, but I feel like we haven't gotten enough of that talk. And talking right. to guys who actually make the lines is just so fascinating that I'm excited to see to hear what Chris has to say. Yeah, absolutely. I had Chris on the Football Analytics Show not too long ago and just, just a lot of great insights um, you know, and obviously, you know, he's very kind to give these out because he's yeah. giving them out to people that are going to be going against him right. <laughs> in the state of Nevada. Um, but, but Chris is fantastic. Absolutely. We'll get to that in just a little bit, but before we do so, we have to take a look back at last week. We mentioned John Sheeran. We had John Sheeran on the show to break down the wild card round. We're going to go back through the bets that John had mentioned, the sides he preferred there, and also what we had on what was a very interesting wild card weekend. So let's go back to that and then circle back around to the divisional round. Covering the past. 
Last week, we had John Sheeran, as mentioned, of FanDuel Sportsbook on to preview the wild card round. Find John on Twitter at jsheeran1981. Started things off on Saturday afternoon, where John was favoring the Texan side at minus two and a half. And they did need overtime to get it, but they wound up covering in that one. So a win for John there with the Texans minus two and a half. And uh, Ed, we were talking in Slack, in the number fire Slack during that game. And, you know, people were getting into Josh Allen. And I was like, he's got some Jameis in him. And <laughs> he went full Jameis after that. I, like, didn't expect it to go that bad. But, like, when Josh Allen runs bad, Josh Allen runs bad. It's wild. Yeah, no, he, he's wild in particular. I, you know what? I didn't think that he could make... Well, actually, I know he could make some of those throws, but Josh Allen has more consistently done things that I just did not think was possible on yeah. the NFL level for him. In the positive so, and the negative sense. Because well, the, no, I'm just, the, no, I expected all the negative, Jim. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I expected this to be the biggest disaster in, in Buffalo yeah. Bills history. And, and I, I still don't really like the long-term prospects for that franchise. Um, but I, I, I got to give props to Josh Allen. Like yeah. he's, he made some throws and he's made more throws in what I've seen this year than I, than I thought he could ever do at the NFL level. I think and, I've and watched made... too much. Josh Allen is my issue. Um, because I live in Syracuse, which means we get all the Buffalo games. Yeah, right, right. And if you watch enough Josh Allen, it's kind of like we talked about it. It's not comparable, but it's a similar sentiment we got when we were talking to Evan Silva, where he says, we remember the bad plays. I remember right. a lot of really freaking bad plays by Josh Allen, and right. those stand out to me. But we have to remember he can make the dazzling play too, and yeah. that matters. It'll be interesting to see what he does in the future. I think I like the organization. I like the way they attack things. I love the way they address the offensive line this year in taking mid-level free agents and trying to address that similar to what they did at wide receiver. I liked their approach. They did things. They were very analytically smart this year. Uh, if you take a look at their play calling yeah. tendencies and stuff. So I think I have some faith in the organization. I am just not sold on their quarterback yet. Hopefully right. he can benefit from them being analytically savvy, but he's not boring. See, he's like yeah. Mike Leach. Not boring. <laughs> not boring. Definitely not boring. <laughs> then we had Saturday night. We had the Patriots versus the Titans, and all three of us had something on this game. Uh, both you and John mentioned the Patriots minus five and a half against the Titans. And then I had the under on 44 and a half points and the Titans covered and won there. Uh, but the under did hit by a pretty comfortable margin. Uh, it, it was actually pacing to go over in the first half, but I think that the Patriots offense was kind of just worse than we could have yeah. possibly anticipated. And like they had showed that, but it's just weird to see it on such a big stage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they weren't good. And I mean, another thing that stuck out, I, the offense has been good enough that it has kind of masked the fact that Belichick has gotten really lame on fourth down. Like he, he just doesn't go for it. Yeah. And I feel like that really showed up in this game. I mean, they were in Tennessee territory with a fourth and one uh, did not go for it, decided to punt. We're on the goal line, um, had another opportunity. And, you know, I get that their offensive line was having issues, right? Like they, they couldn't right. do anything in the short yard situation. I think they, you know, Tom Brady in the past has been, phenomenal at the quarterback sneak maybe they decided he was too old for that um so i i think when you're when you're not as good as you have been and and they've really been good on the offensive side of the ball for for the last however many years um then all of a sudden if you're not going for it on fourth and one it it, it kind of rears its head yeah. and so they, they just couldn't get it done you're losing those little edges and those are the little edges the patriots have always had and right. that becomes a bigger issue when you're not as good. You're not good enough to make up for it elsewhere. And exactly. I think that really did show up. And I think that what you were saying was correct in that because the offense wasn't as good, Belichick felt he couldn't be as aggressive. But, but. the weird thing was the Titans did the same thing, like that punt. Um, where they took the intentional delay of game and they ran the clock down like a minute or whatever. Like that was still a really conservative call, but right. it didn't matter. And like, uh, it was a weird game. Um, I'm glad I had the under on that game. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have faith in, in either offense. Ryan Tannehill did nothing there to kind of prove me wrong. We'll talk more about him later, both with uh, both with Chris and then in my covering the future too. But, yeah, I, I'm having a hard time there for sure. Uh, moving on to the Sunday games, John and you both said your numbers favored the Vikings at plus 7.5, but 
the <laughs> anecdote around the, the Saints pushed you away. And, like, I don't blame you. I think that was yeah. probably a savvy move not to go there. But, hey, the numbers were right again. Uh, even though it's not necessarily a bet we recommended, your numbers right. were right, Ed. Like, it's it, I don't know. There's been a couple times this year where your numbers have been spot on. It's just been other things around it that have pushed us away. Yeah, absolutely. I think we saw one of the worst games from New Orleans offense. I think we saw one of the best games from Minnesota defense that's really struggled and, and looked pretty old. Uh, their pass rush looked pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Thielen looked pretty bad in parts of the game and then comes up with a big catch towards the end. Uh, I mean, that's the NFL, right? Uh, yeah. You know, even as high as I was on New Orleans, you know, I had a 29% chance that Minnesota was going to win that game. So, right. I mean, not quite one in three. It, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and, and it did in this game. Yeah. Thielen had like that terrible fumble. He had a drop. I think he had a hold yep. on a, on a running play too. He was terrible in the first half. And then second half, he goes nuts. And then we had the, the long Taysom Hill completion followed by a Drew Brees fumble because nothing makes yeah. sense. It was just, yep. it was, it was a fun game. You know, I'm from Minnesota. Was, I was pretty was, excited about it. So it was, fun. it was a great game. And, and yeah. they were, weren't they saying that the ratings were incredible this wild card weekend, which probably, which is what you would expect when you had two amazing games going to overtime. You had the whole yep. narrative of how about how Buffalo hadn't won a playoff game since whenever. I you think had Brady when, potentially at the end of the dynasty type thing. Yeah. Um, so and I mean I mean Buffalo's win probability. I mean what was Buffalo's win probability at sixteen nothing midway through the third quarter or, or later? Five seventy five might be conservative. Seventy five um, I think is conservative. I. Uh, Again, that's so. the Josh Allen creeping in because <laughs> there's nothing. So. And everything then I got about Josh a, Allen is volatile. <laughs> and then I got into a big argument with my mother-in-law, who's a Buffalo fan, about the oh, no. about the kickoff. Oh yeah. And giving himself up, and so she was irate about that. And I was oh, like, with the fair catch or the yeah. non-fair catch? Yeah. The yeah. fair catch, non-fair catch, like yeah. clearly gave himself up. <laughs> I was staring at it. I was like, yo, he just called fair catch. And I thought I was like going insane. And then they like started talking about it. And I was like, okay, well, I feel better at least. But that was weird. Uh, it was it was weird. But yeah, I mean, overall, the, the week was awesome. And I am excited for younger quarterbacks to thrive now that Breeze and Brady are out. Like, I like watching them play. But I want to see Mahomes, Jackson, those guys do what they can do. Uh, final game on Sunday was Eagles-Seahawks. John said he liked the Eagles plus one and a half. And the Seahawks obviously did cover there. Hard to know what impact uh, Carson Wentz getting hurt would have had. It was the exact same score they had the first meeting when Carson Wentz was fully healthy for the full game. Right. I just think it kind of sucks that Carson Wentz didn't get a chance to like prove himself here. He would have had a tough... It would have been tough for him regardless because they didn't have Brandon Brooks, didn't have Lane Johnson. He would have been in a very tough spot, but it stinks to have someone get that chance and then not get a chance to prove themselves. So I just mostly I just feel bad for Carson Wentz. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I mean, if you're betting Philadelphia plus whatever right. at home, that's a, that's a bummer too, not having your, right. your main guy exactly. uh, so. to come back and maybe get that win. Yep, and we'll break down the divisional round next with Chris Andrews in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21-plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And, of course, uh, there are also retail FanDuel Sportsbook book all across the U.S. outside of those states as well. Let's bring in Chris Andrews now to break down the divisional round of the playoffs. Find him on Twitter at Andrews Sports. Again, he is the director of the South Point Sportsbook. Wrote a book this June called Then One Day, 40 Years of Bookmaking Nevada. We're going to talk to Chris about that and get set for all four games this weekend. Covering the present. Let's welcome Chris Andrews into Covering the Spread to preview the divisional round of the NFL playoffs. Chris, it is a pleasure to have you on the line for today. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, thanks. And let me say it's my pleasure talking to you guys. It, uh, you know, I love talking to smart people, and uh, you guys definitely uh, make the grade. Way better than I do, I can tell you that. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so, Chris. Uh, you, you have 40 years of bookmaking experience in Nevada, and you wrote about that in your book called Then One Day, 40 Years of Bookmaking in Nevada. 
Uh, tell us about how the book came about and what people can expect to find in the book. Well, the book came about from uh, a segment I did on Gil uh, Alexander's show. Well, on his podcast first, and then we did it on his show, too. Um, and uh, Gil always called it story time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just telling stories of the old days. And, uh, you know, I, I'm 63 years old and came to Las Vegas in 1979. And, you know, stuff that was just kind of normal to me, I didn't realize just how new and different it was to – to guys that are, you know, a lot, are certainly much younger than me, and just see the see the scenario and the, the industry right now, and uh, didn't realize all the changes that happened and and how we got here, and uh, so me telling those stories just really resonated with a lot of a lot of folks. You know, the old guys like me liked hearing it, and the young guys were just fascinated with uh, the changes that came about. And, uh, you know, the evolution of the industry from, from 1979 and, you know, how we got to where we are today. So uh, that, that's what – and they encouraged me to write the book, and, uh, and I did. And it's, uh, it has resonated with a lot of people. They like, they like reading it, and the, the sales have been really good. And, um, you know, I, I was glad to write it. It was a great connect. You don't make a fortune writing these books, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's more a connection with people, and I feel I've, I've had that connection. That makes me feel good. Absolutely. Well, Chris, I've read the book. It's yeah. uh, fantastic. There's so many good stories, not only from kind of your experience, uh, but, uh, you know, bad bookmaking from from other people in your industry <laughs> yeah. that, that are not as talented as you are, Chris. So uh, I highly recommend that uh, everyone go check that out. And Chris, I want to ask, what are some of the biggest changes that you've noticed? I was reading up, uh, you know, on Visa and they've got, you know, a bio of you and I was reading up at some of those there, but for you in your time, in your 40 years, what are some of the biggest changes you have noticed over that time? Well, I just, the market has grown and the options have grown. I, I remember going into Bill Dark's uh, casino uh, sports book in North Las Vegas. I mean, this is you know, in the late seventies. And, uh, I remember seeing a, a football game and, you know, I saw the point spread like minus seven. And I said, what's that, what's that 38 up there next to it? And, I said, and the guy told me, well, that's, that's the total, the over and under, you could bet that too. I said, really? I don't think I'd ever heard of that, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was just one of the changes that was brand new. And as far as I know, Bill Dark was the first one to use those, um, you know, but I'm sure if Bill was around today, he'd claim credit for it. But I'm not, I'm not sure he invented it. But uh, that was the first time I had seen it, and so that just shows you where the industry has gone. I mean, that was like a brand new thing, and then you know, we started doing, uh, you know, money lines and half times, and you know, the the market has just expanded so so much in in the years since then. That like I said, guys don't realize. You know, when I well, first of all. When my uncle started in this business, and I talk about my uncle Jack prominently in the book, you know, you there the point spread was like a new thing. Before that, it was just the odds to win the game, mm -hmm. and then some guy invented the point spread. I, I wish I could recall his name. I can't offhand, but you know, the point spread and that obviously really changed the industry so dramatically because now that you know the point spread is supposedly the great equalizer. And, uh, you know, that changed the business. And, you know, it's just been uh, one evolution after another since that time. And that's how – and here we are today with uh, with uh, the industry the way it is. And, and people just take so much for granted. But it, we had we had the start at point A. And, you know, I guess we're at point B now. But they'll look, you know, years from, from now and say, wow, that's all you guys did? Now we're doing all these <laughs> other things too, you know, so – yeah, definitely. And like you look at the the markets for this weekend, you can bet on who's going to have the most passing yards for the division round and all these different markets. And, you know, Chris, we can talk to you about, you know, your current state as a bookmaker as well, not just your past, but now over at South Point, obviously you've got a bunch of different markets there. So for you as a bookmaker in 2019 and 2020, what market for you is the most difficult to set when you're setting out lines for an NFL weekend? Which one gives you the most pause and it's the hardest for you as a bookmaker. Well, as far as uh, NFL stuff, it's you know those, those kind of things that you just mentioned, the individual uh, player type stuff. You know, because you really have to you have to look at the matchup, you have to look at the health of whoever you're you're doing. And you know, let's say like you know Ingram, a guy this week. Yeah. You know, you got to look at him. He's you know he's 
you know, he's, first of all, he's 30 years old, which to me is hard enough to believe right there, but he's 30 <laughs> years old, which is, you know, old for a running back. And, you know, he's been, been banged up a little bit lately. And, uh, you know, is he going to play? I mean, I, I don't think he was a full participant in practice today. You know, is he going to play? How much is he going to play? How much are they going to feature him? You know, he's, uh, you know, certainly a, an important part of the team if, if and when he's healthy. You know, so those kind of things are really come into play. So, uh, and then you have to look at the matchup again. You know, who who are they playing? How good are they against, you know, whatever type of, uh, uh, you know, or, you know, if it's a quarterback, what kind of def- uh, pass defense are they looking at? Running back, what kind of run defense are you, are you looking at? You know, what's what's the nature of the game? I always said a, na- a game takes on uh, a life of itself. You know, like look at the Super Bowl last year. You know, total I think it was 56 or something like that. I want to say, and we wound up 13-3. Uh, but the game does take on a life of its own. And uh, and you know, before the game, we kind of think we know what's going to happen. We know, you know, usually pretty close to what's going to happen. But there's always that aberration. And like I said, that Super Bowl is a perfect example. We expected a high-scoring game with two uh, terrific offenses, and it turned into anything but that. And uh, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll look back on this weekend in one of these games that we expect to go a certain way. You know, we'll go nothing like that. But um, you know, can we anticipate it beforehand? I mean, some people do, and as close as we can get to that, uh, you know, the, the more successful you'll be as a as a as a gambler or bookmaker. And uh, but it's hard to do. But I'd say for me personally, the the biggest challenge is setting those individual right. matchups. That that's always tough. Chris, can you give uh, the audience just a sense for how you set the line, you know, kind of how numbers play a part and, and what you're looking to do as a bookmaker for an NFL spread? Well, I try to set the right line. Now, what's that mean? You know, I try to give, uh, you know, a price that I feel uh, gives, you know, both sides a 50-50 chance of, of winning the bet. Uh, that doesn't always mean you're going to get bets on, you know, 50-50 as far as equal bets. I mean, in fact, that's almost impossible. It really doesn't happen. And, you know, guys that are maybe have like a little bit of knowledge in this business think that that's the goal of the bookmaker. It's really not. And like I said, for, and, and certainly speaking for myself, you know, I think that, you know, we want to put up a number that gives us a 50-50 chance of winning the bet. But then once the market starts coming in and you see you know, which way the number's going, yeah, you want to go. You want to get on the side of, of the, the sharper betters, and you know you, you can do that sometimes. Sometimes you can't, because if the public is on the same side as the uh, sharp betters, and uh, you know you might be in a little bit of trouble in that game. And that's you know happened plenty of times to me over my yeah. career. But you're trying to get in with you know when you see the smart money come in on one side or the other, uh, you know you try to move that accordingly. And if the public's on the other side. Then you know you, you try to not react to what they're doing. Now at some point, like I said, there there is times when they're on the same side, and you know that's uh, and then you got to try to beat that game. And, and we certainly have beaten our share of those games over the course of time, but we've lost an inordinate amount too, I would say. You know, so those are the things you have to look at. But having 50-50 action on both games, that's that's you know. Uh, that's an ideal that you're never going to get. Number one, number two. I'm not sure you want to get that ideal. You know, you'd rather go in with the sharp guys, needing the same side as they do. That's that's probably your best bet in the long term. Interesting. And I think that it's it's always important to be reactive to the market. Are there situations where you have a number that you want to stick to, even if the sharps are against it, or are you going to just kind of listen to what they're telling you to do, essentially? Uh, you know, probably most of the time I'm listening to what they're yeah. telling me. Now, that that doesn't mean 100%, certainly. Right. But most of the time, I do have to have a lot of respect, you know, for the Ed Fengs of the world. You know, when they come <laughs> in on the side, you know, seriously, i got to respect that. Yep. And, uh, and I'm not going to just ignore it, I can tell you that. Um, you know, there's times it's just the opposite when the public comes in on the side. I love when they say, well, that, that looks like a trap game. It's a trap game. And <laughs> probably... Probably ninety five percent of the time it's they're betting on a road favorite, and they <laughs> just the number doesn't look high enough to them and they you know that's uh they, oh that was a trap game it's, you know no I've never heard a bookmaker once never say, oh, we're gonna set a trap for him in this game. I never heard that you know <laughs> but 
but guys like to think that, and like I said, usually it's when usually a favorite that's not high enough, and mostly a road favorite that's not high enough is uh, that's how these guys think. So, uh, you know, naturally we try to take advantage of that when that comes around. That's uh, just what happens. Let's dive into a couple of games here, Chris. Uh, Starting off with the Vikings at the 49ers. Uh, 49ers at FanDuel Sportsbook are seven-point favorites. And obviously, Chris, you're over at South Point. So you can always feel free to mention the number you have there if it differs from FanDuel. Uh, The total here is 44.5. And And this 49ers defense, I think, is very interesting from a bookmaking perspective because they got off to this really hot start this year. And they've cooled uh, partly because of injuries, but the guys that got hurt, like Quan Alexander and D Ford, are coming back now. So, as a bookmaker, how are you weighing what you saw from the 49ers early on versus what we've seen from them recently when trying to set a line for this team or a team like them? Okay, well, a couple things. First of all, that number opened mostly six and a half. I opened seven. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was a better number. We'll go over that in a second. But they did gobble up the seven quickly. Uh, and then I went into the market, and like I said, I had to respect the play that they gave me. Uh, it was uh, sharp betters that took the seven. Now we're back to seven on that game, and I can see they're coming in strongly, even minus the seven. And uh, I know what you're saying about the defense. I looked, and uh, I don't have the figure offhand, but I think that the last six weeks, I want to say, they gave up 20 or 21 points or more in every single one of those games. Uh, their offense has been good enough to overcome that for the most part. Uh, I, when I talked to Ed a couple weeks ago, one of the things I mentioned was, uh, you know, sometimes momentum, not always the best thing to do in the NFL, but you can get a hot team uh, late in the season, in December and into January. And a lot of times, uh, you know, a healthy team is a hot team. And the Niners have not been healthy, but I really think this week off has helped them quite a bit. You mentioned some of the defensive guys that are coming back this week. And I think that defensive line, uh, who was terrific early in the early part of the season, probably not quite so terrific the last third of the season, I think that's finally uh, gotten a little bit healthier. Uh, and I think that their defense will be very, very good. Now, the Vikings, that's a team that's playing some pretty good ball. They have some uh, health issues, I think, on the offensive side, uh, particularly with their wide receivers. I know Diggs had the flu. Uh, I think he still has it as we speak. Uh, I, you know, guys like that, healthy kids, you know, he really, really, I mean, he's still a kid. I mean, he figures to get healthy by, by Saturday. Uh, Thielen, maybe not so much. You know, he's been hurt for a while now, and he's been a pretty important part of the offense. Now, they, they obviously won last week and battled through that. But uh, I'm not sure it's a perfect uh, scenario for them this week, and I think uh, I think with a week off, I think that really helps the Niners. Again, I'm not trying to really pick the winner, but I thought seven was a bet- much better number than six and a half. I mean, to me, six and a half was a one-way number. You had to lay that and not take it. Seven, I think that gives you pause. And like I said, I'm not trying to pick the winner because I think laying seven in an NFL game, you know, almost at any time could be a dangerous thing. Uh, but I do think seven was a best, much better number than six and a half. And I'm looking around, I see pretty much all seven. There's some sevens, uh, there's some sevens with juice on the dog. But I think seven is is a much much better number uh, going forward. As a matter of fact, I think we might even get over the seven at some point. We don't use juice here at the South Point. We use everything at eleven and ten. So if we move off to seven, we're going to wind up going to seven and a half. I hope that's not the situation because that would leave us a little bit vulnerable. Uh, but uh, that, but I could see where that might happen. And again, I think, I think six and a half was a one-way number where seven is uh, giving people a little bit more pause. And I hope we don't have to move off that seven. I think seven's, I think seven's actually a pretty good number to use. Excellent. Yeah, I really enjoyed that conversation when we talked about you know, that you can follow momentum much more so in college football uh, than the NFL. Following momentum kind of gets you killed, except for maybe the next team. Uh, Titans <laughs> are at Ravens this year. Uh, Ravens have been uh, phenomenal. They are nine and a half point favorite in this game. Uh, total at 46 and a half. Uh, FanDuel started out at 10. Uh, apparently he's been bouncing around. Would love to know, Chris, what you had this game initially and, and where you're at right now. Uh, yeah, forget everything I just said about the last game. <laughs> so uh, I saw this number open 10, 
I I opened nine and a half. They, they I mean they laid it to me pretty quickly. Uh, we went to ten. They they took the ten. I'm I'm at nine right now. And again, I think I think nine is just a much better number. Now I don't want to go crazy one way or the other here because I do think the Ravens have had uh, a terrific team all year. I think they're really well coached. I think uh, Lamar Jackson certainly deserves to be the MVP. He's been terrific all season, but. There is some momentum on the side of the Titans. They've played much, much better since Tannehill has been the quarterback. I think Vrabel is also a very good coach. And Tannehill, you know, listen, I mean, we've, we've seen this for, for years. Uh, you know, a quarterback has to kind of find the right situation for himself. And you look back and, you know, guys like, like Joe Montana, who I think is a fantastic quarterback. But he was also very lucky to wind up with Bill Walsh. Uh, you know, we could say the same about Tom Brady. I think he's a terrific quarterback, but he was also very, very lucky to find a coach and a system that, that fit him perfectly. You know, Tannehill was not so fortunate the first, uh, whatever, six, seven years of his career. It might have been a little less than that. But anyway, I think he's found a situation now that really exploits his talent well. And I think Vrabel, like I said, I think he's a good coach. I think we'll look back years from now and say he's a very good coach. Uh, but I think that uh, this situation fits him. I think the team is really playing well, and I think it's a big number. Even at the nine, I think it's a very, very big number. So I think nine's a, a good number uh, as far as a betting number, but I think the ten, I think I, I thought that was ridiculous. I thought that was way too high. Uh, I think ten, you had to take the ten. team's really playing well uh, on, in a lot of facets of the game. And we mentioned Ingram. Uh, not 100%. Sounds like he'll play, yeah. but, but playing and being – effective or two different things so i think he'll play i don't know how effective he'll be but i think uh, i think this titans team has a great shot certainly of covering the number and even a pretty decent shot of winning the game outright chris i want to talk to you more about ryan Tannehill because he's been a really interesting guy this year and i feel like as a as a bookmaker he'd be a hard guy to evaluate because we have this long sample of Tannehill really struggling. But as you mentioned, it's a totally different situation with him in Tennessee versus when he was in Miami under Adam Gase. What was the process for you in evaluating this Titans team? And how long was it before you started to set lines that really reflected the way that Tannehill was playing? Um, that's an interesting question. My Our friend, uh, Gil Alexander, was like Mr. Anti Mariota for a couple <laughs> years now, you know, and I was I kid you, I said I should have listened to you earlier because <laughs> uh, he he had he'd pointed out Mariota wasn't what just wasn't, you know, again not a good quarterback, not playing well. Maybe if he goes to a different team under a different system, maybe he could do well. You know, that's certainly possible because I think the kid does have uh, a certain amount of talent in in certain areas. And if he found the right system, maybe he would thrive. Nonetheless, when they made the change here, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really adjust my power rating at that time. I didn't know what to think of Tannehill. I didn't think much of Mariota. Like I said, I probably should have listened to Gil a little earlier. <laughs> but he, uh, so I didn't really adjust my power rating at that time. Now, as the season progressed, I had to adjust my power rating uh, upwardly. You know, because, like I said, I think Vrabel's a good coach. I think the team's a, a, a good team, has a lot of good things going for them. And, uh, you know, Henry's really playing some decent ball, and uh, the whole team is playing well, and Tannehill seems to fit that team extremely well. Uh, they they kind of got in the, into the playoffs under, in the last week of the season, but they did that, and they did that with uh, – you know, playing good ball with a lot of momentum, and you know, I kind of scoff at momentum in the NFL, but not. Right. But you have to look at each thing individually, and I'm not scoffing at this team and their uh, the mo- mo- momentum that they've created. They're, they're playing terrific ball, and you're getting a big number here. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really a live team. But uh, like I said, I had to adjust my power rating as we saw them play because right. it it was real. It was nothing that. Uh, they could just kind of, you know, poo-poo and say that it's uh, they were beating a bunch of stiffs and all that. You know, they they beat who they were playing, but 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 regardless, they were they were playing uh, they were playing good football, and I think they've they've that's a team that's that's gotten better and better as the season has progressed. All right, so it should be a fun game on Saturday night. Let's move now to the Sunday games. We got the Texans at the Chiefs in Arrowhead. The Chiefs nine and a half point favorites, and the total is fifty-one. And 
This Texans team is, at least for me, been kind of hard to figure out this year. They're pretty volatile. They win at home against New England, lay a massive egg against Drew Locke and the Broncos. What about you, Chris? Uh, has it been hard for you to evaluate this Texans team? Because I, I, I think they've been impossible at times. Uh, yeah, I would probably echo those same sentiments. <laughs> you know, I, First of all, I think Deshaun Watson is a terrific quarterback. And uh, we've talked about Lamar Jackson definitely deserves the MVP this year. But I think when we look back on their careers, you know, with a lot of moving parts, coaching and, you know, surrounding uh, uh, talent, I, I, I'm not sure Watson won't be the better quarterback when we look back because I, I kind of think he will be myself. Uh, Bill O'Brien, you know, I'm a Penn State guy, so I, I kind of like <laughs> O'Brien. What he what he did at Penn State, certainly. But, you know, there's, there's – been a lot of inconsistencies in his uh, pro career. He gets knocked an awful lot. I'm not sure that's accurate because he's made the playoffs in uh, like four of the six years or something like that as a coach. You know, um, so I don't I don't want to knock him too much. But there has been some some very questionable things on his side as far as being a coach. Um, you know, I think all that kind of comes into play and. You know, inconsistent means not always bad, not always good. You know, so there's been some good things certainly out of the Texans, but yeah, I'm kind of like you. I think I think they are a very difficult team to figure. On the other hand, I think this Chiefs team, this is a team that's playing really well, and uh, I think if you look at Andy Reid, he is one of those guys that's made some some poor in-game decisions. I think, but overall, I think he's a very very good coach, and right now the the Chiefs. Defense is playing extremely well. Their offense has had some up and downs, ups and downs, but a lot of that had to do with Mahomes' health. And right now, he seems to me to be pretty healthy. I think the week off certainly helps the Chiefs. Uh, I'm, I forget what the record is with Andy Reid coming off a bye, and I'm not sure what that uh, translates to in the playoffs. It may be a different situation. But I do think uh, – Right now, I like the higher number with the Chiefs because I, I think, I think they're playing the best ball right now. And if you gun to my head, I know the Ravens are probably uh, the best team and deserve to be the number one seed. But like I said, gun to my head, I think I would take the Chiefs. I, th- I think they're playing the best of everybody, and defensively, offensively, I think that that's going to be one tough out. And I expect them to win this game. Um, like I said, I, I'm I'm going to use the highest number I see around on this game. And right now, I don't see any tens. Uh, my action is pretty even on this one. But if I see tens popping up, I'm not going to hesitate to go because I do think they're the right side in this game. Interesting. Uh, Houston did visit Kansas City earlier this year. Uh, Kansas City closed as a three and a half point favorite in early October. Uh, so, do you think the market has just shifted that much appropriately uh, towards the Chiefs? Yes, I do think it's shifted appropriately. I think right now, like I said, their defense is really playing well. And that was the question mark coming into this game. Uh, I mean, coming into this season, uh, as far as the Chiefs go. But their defense has just gotten better and better over the course of the season. I think if you look back at the last five, six weeks, uh, that defense is playing as well as anybody. And uh, and I think Mahomes, and uh, you know, we talked about Deshaun Watson, Lamar Jackson, but you know, I, I mean, to me, still Mahomes is the head of the class. And he's got a lot of help around him. He's got a great coach that I think really fits him well. And, uh, and all that comes into play. But, uh, you know, all, all that being said, yeah, I think the Chiefs are the best team right now. And, uh, and like, like I said, if, this, if I see 10 uh, popping up on this game, I'm not going to hesitate to go because I think that's the right side. And, uh, and uh, I, if I can have the Chiefs going for me in this game, then that's what I'm going to try to do. If yeah, we're talking about the the bye week for the Chiefs. This may be only the sixth time all year they've had all five of their offensive linemen healthy. I think that bye week was pretty impactful for them. Let's finish up here with the Seahawks at the Packers. I was talking about the Texans being hard to figure out. I don't know either of these teams. They are confusing as heck. Uh, the Packers, four-point favorites over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The total here is 47. And when you look at advanced numbers on both these teams – they tend to say that these teams are not as good as their records would indicate. So what has been your read on both the Seahawks and Packers so far this year, Chris? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that statement. Uh, both of these teams ha- have kind of outplayed their metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you look uh, just at some very simple numbers uh, with uh, with Aaron Rodgers, you, you, 
if you look at some simple numbers, you think what a great year he's had. If you delve a little deeper, it's probably not that great. But here they are with a bye Mm -hmm. and playing at home. And the week off probably has helped them too. Uh, That, you know, for me, uh, and in the South Point right now, it's probably the best team to advance to the Super Bowl out of the NFC for us. I can tell you that. So I'm going to probably be rooting for them come Sunday, uh, regardless of what, where the action is. Now, right now, uh, this number opened mostly three and a half. I like the four a lot better. So I opened four, and they grabbed it off me right away. Uh, you know the way those market is. You know, you, you're a half point off, and they, they can't wait right. to jump on it. And they did, but meanwhile, you know, it's gone to four, and I'm even starting to see a lot of four and a halves pop up. Um, I'm not sure about the four and a half. I, I probably like that a little bit better than the four, but I'm not ready to go that yet. I'm still, uh, with that early action I had on the Seahawks, I'm still a little heavy with Seahawk money. Uh, you know, the Seahawks, they, uh, you know, they've had a lot of injuries themselves. You know, and they, they, I don't think they're all that great of a team. I love Russell Wilson. I, you know, I really, uh, up until the last, you know, month of the season, I thought that he was a very legitimate candidate to be the MVP, a very deserving candidate. But you know, Lamar Jackson just really uh, blew by him there. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that uh, I think Russell Wilson is just a terrific quarterback and can keep them in this game. Um, but I'm not crazy about the rest of the team, and I think uh, I think the week off is probably really going to help the Packers here. Uh, I, I say that with all the teams because you know really that 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 week off at this point in the season just means an awful lot, and these teams deserve it. The ones that, that earned it, you know, they they earned it and they got it. You know, good for them. And uh, I do I kind of like the Packers a little bit in this spot. I'm not crazy about them, but the four I think uh, I think four is a pretty good betting number in this spot. But uh, yeah, both teams uh, probably probably outplayed their metrics, both of them. Uh, so I'm not sure which way to go on this game. That's why I think four is a pretty good number. And by the way, let me say this before we go any further: whoever decided to change the schedule on Sunday and have two games later, boy, my hats go off to him. I think that's <laughs> great for for yeah. bookmakers. Uh, I can tell you, it gives them a lot more time to bet these yep. games. So uh, hats off to them. Uh, I think uh, I think we're going to have a terrific Sunday. I think we're going to have a terrific Saturday and a terrific Sunday as far as betting action goes. But you know, I'm not sure which way to go on this game. I, th- I think four is a pretty good number. I thought three and a half was just a little too too light. But four, I think, is pretty good. And if they bet me over the four, then uh, that's fine. I'll move up. But right now, I'm I'm still a little heavy on the Seahawks plus the four. So uh, we'll see where they want to take me. I, I have a feeling I'll probably wind up at four and a half at some point. But uh, I got to say that's that's probably going to be okay. I, if I have the Seahawks at a decent number going for me, uh, I could live with that. That that should be all right. Chris, we know you were probably, uh, you know, talking to the NFL office about moving those games later. <laughs> oh yeah, the yeah. Crash that's coming into the South. Yeah. Coast. On <laughs> sure. Uh, I'd probably have it even later if they asked right. me, but uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll live with this. This is just fine. Yeah. That's outstanding. That is Chris Andrews. Uh, again, make sure you check out his book. You can find it on Amazon. Then one day, 40 years of bookmaking in Nevada. Chris, thank you so much uh, for hopping on here today. Good luck uh, with everything over at the South Point for this weekend. I hope the bets break in your favor. We appreciate your time and we'll talk to you again soon. Hopefully. Uh, my pleasure, guys. Like I said, I always like talking to smart people, and uh, you guys certainly qualify. So uh, my my pleasure, certainly. So uh, good luck to you guys, too, this weekend. Hopefully we'll be on the same side. How's that That's sound? right. <laughs> that yeah. sounds great to me. Sounds Thank good. you so much. That's the side I don't want to be on. <laughs> Covering the future. One final thank you goes out to Chris Andrews for swinging by for today and breaking down the divisional round, Ed. That was a really fun conversation. I love hearing those those stories uh, from Chris, and I kind of want to yeah. go grab the book now because of that. Yeah, you absolutely should. It, it is a great read. Uh, just one anecdote from the book. There, or, uh, it's not one. There's a couple chapters on adventures and bad bookmaking. Oh, good. So, so we all so we all know about NFL teasers, right? You get to <laughs> tease two games by six points. So there's a bookmaker that uh, wanted to do the same thing for hockey. So he wanted to have hockey teasers. And so he put out these he put out these teaser cards where you could move the hockey line six points. <laughs> and he's and he's phoning in his guys like, man, these hockey teasers 
are the best thing ever. <laughs> well, you just have to think about it a little bit. You know, hockey games don't often get to, you know, plus six and <laughs> Full differential so they obviously got killed in that and and i read that and i was in a starbucks in exton pennsylvania and people were wondering like what could possibly be so <laughs> funny that this guy is laughing about reading that book um but just just one of the many adventures in bad bookmaking that was kind of my favorite kind of applying football principles to the game of hockey and uh offering teaser cards uh, but the book is full of great stories like that um, and, and some of them will, will really make your back hurt. I think that one made my, my brain hurt. <laughs> like <laughs> six. Yeah. You know? Six. It's like, Do well, you, you man. Know, it's just a sport. We'll just apply the same, same ideas to, to other sports. It is a charitable donation. We'll view it that way instead. <laughs> I think that's the right way to view it. So again, check that out. Then one day, uh, 40 years of bookmaking Nevada. I found it on Amazon. You can get it for Kindle for less than $10. So uh, check it out there. I always read my Kindle uh, while on the bike at the gym. So uh, definitely a good way nice. to pass the time for sure. Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. And look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. It's called Odds. Fire. It's the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive in now to our bets for this weekend's games, Ed, starting off with you, which game do you want to focus on for this weekend's slate? Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about Seattle at Green Bay. Uh, I've talked about Green Bay all year uh, and how the fact that I think they've been pretty overrated. And I went back and looked at it. They are 8-1 and one in one-score games. So the data suggests that uh, there's a lot of randomness when it comes to one-score games, particularly in the NFL, although it's not any different in college football, uh, even though you think it might be. So um, being 8-1 and one in one-score games is a big part of why they got to 13-3 and three and got a bye. Uh, that kind of record in close games is, is not predictive of how they will do in the future. Um, the offense has been mediocre. When I look at adjusted success rate, they're 17th in the NFL. They're actually worse in passing, uh, 20th than they are in rushing, in which they're 10th. And, you know, I mean, a lot of this comes down to the quarterback position. Uh, earlier this season, Ben Baldwin wrote about how you know, Aaron Rodgers is no longer elite and and it's and his accuracy has really gone down. Uh, I think that is indeed the case from from the games that I've seen. Uh, I feel like he just doesn't set his feet like he, he should sometimes and, and just kind of flings the ball a little bit. Um, I think when he sets his feet and really gets it under him, he, he can still sling it with the best of them. But, um, you know, it just really hasn't been consistent this season. Uh, the Packers defense isn't graded either. Uh, they're also 17th when I look at adjusted success rate. And obviously I'm not too high on Seattle. Uh, we've talked about, you know, their defense is probably going to be the worst unit on the field. Uh, 26th in my adjusted success rate, but they do have Russell Wilson and he's been fantastic this year. Uh, no need to talk more about that. There are some concerning injuries on the offensive line. Two of their starters did not play last week. They were both listed as questionable, and I, I don't know if we can make any definitive statements now. Um, but still, you know, my numbers like Green Bay by about two points. Uh, I think Seattle plus four is is something I like a lot. I think the I think the way that the Packers cover is that Aaron Rodgers outduels Russell Wilson. That certainly can happen. I I just don't think it's probable. Yeah, you alluded to the offensive line issues, and those are the biggest reason I I kind of want to stay away from this game because Pete Carroll said Wednesday that he thought Dwayne Brown had a chance to play. Pete Carroll tends to be fairly delusional. Uh, I don't know if that's the right, that's the right word. That's the word I would use for it when it comes to player injuries. Last okay. week he said Dwayne Brown was probably not going to play, which means to me there is a 0.0% chance. That was for last week's game. This right. week he said he has a chance. And to me that says... Point like, you know, five to 10%. That's probably on the low end, but I've been burned by him with injury news so many times. And then Mike Upati, the left guard, is banged up. He, I would guess, doesn't play. Joey Hunt, their center, probably going to go. He played last week. Uh, he was on the injury report all week, too. And then their left tackle, their backup left tackle, George Fant, who is also a tight end, I believe. Um, like, they're a very weird team, but 
they have four different guys who could potentially start on their offensive line who are at least not at full health because Brown had like a knee scope, I think. Yeah, I thought um, Fant played last week. He did, uh, but he's hurt again. Uh, he missed okay. practice Wednesday. He and Hunt are in a similar vein where I'm guessing the rest Wednesday was maintenance related um, just because they're not at full health to like get them healthier. So Hunt right. and Fant are going to play. I am less certain on Dwayne Brown and... We talked about this when the Vikings played the Packers. The strength of the Packers' defense is their defensive line, mostly because they're all Northwestern guys, obviously. Um, but, like, that's kind of the only area where they're good is their defensive line. Right. That worries me, but I also I can't have a lot of faith in the Packers either, so it's hard for me to kind of get a real gauge on this, which is why I was talking to Chris about it, I, I've got no idea how to look at this game. Right. It's wild. Well, it sounds sides. like he doesn't really have much of an idea either. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> feel the strongest about uh, about Seattle in this game. So yeah, I think that makes sense. And uh, I, if if Pete Carroll is being truthful to us and Dwayne Brown does play, that make me feel a lot better about Seattle plus four. So that's one I keep an eye on for sure. Also, for my cover in the future, I want to go back to the Titans. Shocker, I know um, the Mariota guys talking trash on Ryan Tannehill, and I was considering the game under here at forty six and a half points. Because I expect both these teams to be pretty run heavy, and that tends to lend itself to an under. But I can also see a scenario in which the Ravens just kind of drop the hammer here and hit that number themselves. So I don't want to root against Lamar Jackson, kind of we were talking about with Teddy before, where like some bets are not fun to root for. I don't want to root against Lamar Jackson scoring points. So we're going to ignore right. the, the the game total. And talking about the Titans team total in 19 and a half points, so... I'm going to take the under on that. And as mentioned heading into last week, Ryan Tannehill had a pretty easy schedule after he took over from Mariota this year. He had only 18% of his dropbacks come against top 10 pass defenses based on number fires metrics. That was the fourth fewest uh, among guys with at least 300 dropbacks. And he was just kind of okay against top 20 pass defenses. He was at 0.04 passing net expected points per dropback. The league in that same split is about right there. So he's roughly league average when he was facing a non-terrible defense. And against the Patriots last week, Tannehill didn't do a whole lot. Had a couple of key third down conversions, uh, but also had a really bad pick. And the Ravens defense, I think, is underrated by their full season metrics. They ranked fourth in schedule adjusted pass defense at number fire. And that includes the time before the Marcus Peters trade, before Jimmy Smith got healthy. So I would say... The Ravens' defense right now is in the same tier as the Patriots and the 49ers, and I think that's favorable for them against Tannehill in a tough spot for Tannehill for sure. There's also some wind in the forecast right now, 15-mile-per-hour uh, winds. That should help keep a lid on the passing game. And the Titans showed last week they can score points and win with their rushing attack, but I'm not sure they can get over 19.5 points without at least some success through the air, so... I'm going to bet on this Ravens defense showing up once again and helping the Titans hit the under on 19 and a half points. If you look at the straight up like numbers, uh, the implied total for the Ravens or for the Titans is 18.75. So if we're getting them at, at 19 and a half with minus 110 on the under, I'm okay taking that. Uh, so I will go under 19 and a half on the Titans specifically, Ed, again, because I don't want to root against Lamar Jackson. So we're just going <laughs> to avoid that altogether. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I mean, my numbers aren't as high on uh, Baltimore's defense. I mean, I do like what they're doing in the secondary. Uh, not as high on the front seven. So we'll see how that matchup shakes up with, uh, yeah. with uh, you know, I mean, obviously you can't count on Derrick Henry to just bust open a lot of plays either. Maybe you can't um, so. at this point, honestly. <laughs> he's he's an outlier. Uh, it's weird. I I don't know. Like, I have doubted Derrick Henry far too often in my life, and I feel like I just need to give up. Like, <laughs> it's hurt me so many times in daily fantasy, specifically, like right. being against Derrick Henry. So, right. he's he's broken my will. I think. Right. Well, if he breaks your will a couple more times, he's gonna keep getting. Uh, someone's gonna pay him. Yeah. So see oh, he's a free it. agent this year. Yeah. So. Be That's a fascinating to decision, too, because, like, they are one of the few offenses that has, like, heavy, heavy splits based on whether their starting right. running back is on the field or off. And, like, right. I, I don't think you can ever really justify paying a running back a ton of money, right. but I could see them doing it still. So he'll be interesting. Yeah. 
They have both him and Tannehill actually as free agents this year. So going to be a wild off season for Tennessee, and I'm thinking yep. it may uh, it may be starting this weekend. That is all we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Ed, what's going on for you this week over at the Power Rank and on the Football Analytics Show? Um, yeah, you know, I had J.J. Zacharyson on the Football Analytics Show, talked about that yesterday, and then, uh, you know, just plugging away with, with football predictions at the site. You can always sign up for my free email newsletter, uh, get a sample of my best predictions, usually saved for paying members of the site. Uh, check that out at thepowerrank.com. And find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank as well. I am at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. You can follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Chris Andrews for swinging by today and breaking down his thoughts on the divisional round. Follow him on Twitter at Andrews Sports. Thank you to Teddy Savransky at Teddy underscore covers for talking about the national championship yesterday. And of course, a thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer for running the video side of things for today and chopping up those clips for the at FanDuel Twitter account. And you can find all these episodes on YouTube uh, with the FanDuel YouTube page as well. Thank you, Cal. Good luck to everyone with your bets for the divisional round and for the college football national championship. I hope the bets break in your favor. We can talk to you once again next week to get you set for the conference championships in the NFL. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>